G'day folks, welcome to part 2 of the flight recorder teardown. Once again this is a Fairchild F800. It is a digital flight recorder that seems to use an analog or mechanical tape recording medium. Uh, it doesn't appear to be anything like the uh, modern solid state based ones like solid state drive. Uh, yeah, let's get this thing out. I've got to get the uh, tape module out yet. We had a look at the cards and everything in the past vi previous video. But, yeah, I've already disconnected the airspeed and altitude tubes. They just run under there through a manifold. So that's all got to come off. Carefully. And we've got to get these connectors off. So let's open this up in a sec. All right, let's see. Very glary off this metal shield. So hopefully the footage comes out all right. Okay, it's coming off as a sealed connector unit. It's well shielded on this side, but there's no shielding can over the board. Doesn't really make much sense. Unless it's just, oh, there we go. So that's the connector block. You've got read and write amplifier boards there. So I'll put them in the box of bits. And I'll take off this connector here which goes to the capstan motor drive. And screw them evenly. to get my big fumbly fingers in there. Get off. There we go. That's out of the way. That's folded up there. I've already taken one, two, three and four screws out. That bracket's broken, but it also looks like someone's drilled a spot weld out or a rivet out from the top, so they must have had a stuck screw at one point and not... Uh, well, it's not spot welded, it's uh, yeah, riveted. They've drilled one out from the top, so they just haven't finished repairing it. It's just held in with one rivet. Still adequate, but yeah. There we go. Let's try not to knock the tripod over again. I haven't done that for a while, but I generally avoid using tripods because they do get in the way. Go easy, clean. Let's put this on the floor. All right. So this heavy little lump. This is the recorder itself, and that is the main drive. It's got a very fine belt around it. Solid stainless or close nickel, not nickel alloy, but uh, chrome alloy. That's the motor. That's what's up inside there. That's the main drive motor. God, there's some glare coming off that. Let's change this position. Now that's better. Get the power out of the way. Well, very tight, and I'm going to strip you out if I'm not careful. Um, let's find a better screwdriver. <laughs> that is very tight. Driver's not in the best nick. Gotta get a new set of these. Just ground the very point off because it is so badly rounded out. There we go. 
feels like it's Loctited. Yep, good stuff, Loctite. Until you get, get to have to remove it like this. <laughs> Especially red Loctite, that, that looks like red. There we go. So these screwdrivers are good as new again. I don't know why they make them so sharply pointed. A lot of the screws, the point bottoms out before the um, the driving edges are actually in the socket of the screw. So at least this way, it fits properly. These are KBAC branded ones. KBAC's a pretty decent company. They make a lot of good, well, I'm, some of my good computer mice are KBAC mice. They do cable wraps and shielding and stuff like that. And you name it, lots of electrical engineering goodies. But don't get me wrong, these are great screwdrivers. I have put a lot of a lot of miles on them. There we go. So that's the main drive. It's got a reduction drive. So you've got motor, primary reduction, secondary reduction. So yeah. Spinning that motor very quickly. You get very little motion. These are only I think these are designed to run a 30 minute loop. And that's about it. So yeah, tape moves very slowly, and it'll encode in digital. So you'd probably get even more than 30 minutes or something on it. This is a 600 volt capacitor or something there. Whatever that is, it's an L pack. Oh, yeah. six point oh six eight plus or minus 10 percent. 600 volts. Yeah, it's a cap. 0.068 microfarad cap. That'll be for the motor. It'll be an AC synchronous motor. 400 hertz AC. Okay. So how do I get into the rest of it? There. Main cap screws. Okay. So that thing over the motor is actually a heat, heat sink. It's all copper. Um, it's got like a black oxide finish. And motor... Serial number 105, it's made by Island Components Group. It's a servo motor, Fairchild part number 9300-218-03. And below that is IMB-001. I'm not seeing any rating on it. Unless it's way over the other side, but I don't really feel like pulling it completely apart. You get the gist of what it does. Yeah, these cap screws have to come out next. Alright, let's go. I've already got a couple of screws out. They're 316, well, 316 key. A quarter inch screw. And a rusty old Allen key. I did buy some new ones, but they're oh, bloody crap metal. They just kept bending. I don't want it to shatter and stab me in the hand. Although, generally, if they bend, like, they're made out of plastic, they're not so bad. It's the really cheap ones that shatter and stab you. Gotta watch out for that. The best ones, I believe, are Bondhos. They're a uh, really high quality American made one. Okay, so. Well, it's not held together by much now. Lift. Okay. That's fireproofing. Tension. Alright, you can see I put the shield back on the mechanicals of it so I can do that and put it down. Look at that. Pretty sure that's stainless. It looks like it's electro polished stainless. You can see the, the mark. You run direct current through it in a certain solution and it polishes the nuts off it like that. But direct current needs a line of sight and you can see where it's cloudy. It's away from where the DC was, but outside comes up like that. All the stuff I make at work, or well, most of the stainless stuff I make at work, gets that treatment. It's really good. That's an outer impact skin shell. Hey. Okay. So, how do you go together? glued together. Oh, I'm going to have to start cutting 
I'll bet you this does have a tape in it because it doesn't look like it's been actually breached. I don't know. That's alright. Aha. Uh -huh. 6 2000, so it's been, that's probably when it was refurbished. Date 10th 2000. 699 GMS grams. 699 grams. Yeah, L3. L3. Communications, is it? Yeah. L3 Communications took over Fairchild years ago. So, that's a composite fireproofing. Yeah, it's all encased in a polyethylene shell or something like that. That'll be poly, probably, probably poly, polypropylene with a very high flame retardant contact, content. It doesn't like burning. It really doesn't like burning. I used to injection mould this stuff a few times to make flue outlet covers for uh, gas heaters. And yeah, you could hold a blowtorch to it and it'll start to melt and flame a little bit, but as soon as you take that torch away, it just self-extinguishes. That's the recorder box. Very well protected, I like it. <laughs> got something real valuable, you want to make it fireproof, well, throw it in one of these. Make an interesting jewellery box. We're going to need a properly sized screwdriver for them so I don't wreck the heads and have to get the grinder out. Well, you can't see much, but let's see if we can move the camera a bit. This cable looks like it comes up and over around there. Yeah. No, oh, they're not captive. I think it's just got a gasket view or something on it. Please be some kind of recording medium in there. Oh, look at that, it does have a tape in it. Wow. Shame there's probably only a couple of devices in the world that can read it, <laughs> and that's probably in the laboratories that these are supposed to go back to. Yeah, yeah, we're going to need macro mode for this one. Let's see. Feeding out from the centre of the spool. It does look like it's supposed to do that. It doesn't look very good, but that's it is a continuous loop. It's not like they can just take it out and turn it over, like a cassette tape. Yeah. Feed out from the centre, feed in from there, and it self-tensions. Self and these little rollers keep it down. Well be done. Not creased or anything. It does its job very well. It's a continuous loop. Don't know how much time it stores, but... That's pretty good. It's all there. Okay, so in the tape unit, what we have is the main feed out from the inside of the spool. It seems to just self-tighten and just uh, continuously loop on its own uh, through this roller here, or idler, down to this idler here which brings the tape into a more vertical state, at least vertical with respect to the uh, chassis itself. Uh, across between these two little optical sensors, it's like an infrared emitter and receiver, so that would tell it when it's looped perhaps or if it's broken. Um, there might be a, I thought I saw a white, just a white streak in the tape where there might have been a clear joiner to tell it when it's looped 
but more than likely that could be to detect a breakage. If the tape breaks or something happens, uh, like derails, comes off the uh, comes off the rollers or something like that, then it'll uh, it'll throw up an error. Tell it that the uh, FDR has failed. Uh, there's two felt wipers here pushing the tape onto these two heads, which have numerous connections on them, a lot of connections, way more than a normal audio tape. I think a normal audio tape has about four. Um, there's another post there, and a guide. That's the main capstan drive and a pinch roller, just like in the normal tape player or VHS play, you've got a capstan motor and drive. The big flywheel on the back is the capstan flywheel. And then the tape feeds back into the spool. It's as simple as that and it just circul circulates continuously. So there's not an awful lot to it when you look at it compared with say a normal VHS or uh, audio cassette player but it's just a slightly more well built and elaborate design. It's just a continuous loop with no rewind. There's no period at which it has to stop and rewind. This should just be a continuous loop of tape with a detector to tell it if it breaks or well yeah if it just breaks or just comes off its uh, guides. And as you can see if we turn it carefully in the right direction yep. Why aren't you moving? I am turning you in the right direction. It's having issues. I don't know, that's normal. There we go. I think it's a bit unhappy. I'm probably not the first person to play with it, but it is uh, working correctly. Mind you, I'm probably turning it too fast and too erratically for the mechanism to work. But it doesn't look like it's doing much, but that tape is passing all the way through past the pinch roller and the capstan and into here. And what the capstan does is it actually pulls the tape through. This is just slack and there'll be a tensioner, probably these two felt pads and this little uh, idler here that doesn't feel to have any tension on it and the intention from the pulling out of the reel and these felt pads is all that it needs there's no break on the spool on a VHS player for example there's little felt brakes that push on the, uh, the take up the uh, feed out reel or even a band, a brake band and uh, yeah, if they if they fail, you end up with tape bailing up in the mechanism and chewing tapes and other things like that. The amount of times I've replaced faulty brakes and idler tyres on VHS players, God, thank God I don't have to do that anymore. At least not re rarely do I touch a VHS player. I've got a couple inside at the moment. I just don't use them. Very rarely do I use VHS. I don't have any actual... Oh, I do have tapes. I've got the old Alien trilogy and a lot of X-Files and things on VHS. Audio cassette. I don't have any. None. But very similar to an audio... Basically an audio, audio cassette recorder, but data. Computer data. It's like an old reel-to-reel -reel computer recorder. Tape, tape drive, I guess. You could call it similar to an 8mm tape drive. That tape's definitely 8mm eight, eight in width, or at least very close. It looks like 8mm tape. Let's try not to wreck it. Seven millimeter, and that was on a diagonal. All right, camera's got to move. Ah, it's 
it's more like um, quarter. Yeah, it's quarter inch tape. That is not eight millimeter, that is quarter or something like that. Of course, it's American. <laughs> it's not one of their metricated tapes. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I'm not going to rip this whole thing to bits. I'm going to keep it as it is. I'm going to send an email to the uh, company that recently serviced it and get some more info on it, if I can. But as you can see, there's not a lot of effort put into waterproofing it. I guess because if it goes down 6,000 6, metres below the sea, any air volume trapped in here will cause that casing to implode and destroy the tape. I believe they just rely on the tape's resistance to salt water and fresh water and other stuff like that, microorganisms. The tape would be very, very robust. I don't know what it's made out of, but something very, very resilient. And again, there isn't a tremendous amount of fireproofing on it either, so it's probably designed to withstand a fair bit of heat, although this housing appears to be made out of acetal or something like that. It looks like acetal or nylon. So yeah, if it burns long enough for heat to soak through, it will destroy the tape. You only get about an hour, an hour and a half of high temperature jet fuel burn before the uh, recorder becomes uh, completely unrecoverable. So yeah, that's the tape module. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little peek inside a flight recorder. Um, I know some of you might have been hoping I'd tear it down completely, but nah, this is a rather expensive doorstop and I'd rather keep it as a completely, well, basically a complete expensive doorstop, not completely broken down into individual bits or opening up the transducers and things. Uh, yeah, it's a interesting bit of kit. As you can see, there's the housings. And again, if they try to waterproof that, that's very, very lightweight. It's probably even made out of magnesium or something. And uh, yeah, if they completely waterproofed it, it'd just get to a point where the ocean's pressure would just make it implode. It wouldn't, wouldn't survive. I mean, I've seen the effects of uh, high depth, high pressure, well, these high diving depths on things like styrofoam and. A styrofoam cup goes from normal size down to something about that big just from the uh, ocean's pressure compressing all the little air bubbles or gas bubbles in the foam. Uh, there's not much you can do about that so why not let the water in and just make the tape so damn good that it can resist any sal salinity and other dissolved chemicals and elements. Yeah, it's really good stuff, really interesting tech. Anyway, thanks for watching. It's a hell of a tape recorder. There you go, that's the model. I'll definitely contact the uh, company that refurbished it last and just see if they have any records available. Thanks for watching.